All eyes in the space community are on Russia right now for all the wrong reasons. An anti-satellite test has created over 1,500 pieces of trackable debris and will create hundreds if not thousands of more pieces of smaller orbital debris, some of it not trackable, but that could impact satellites, space missions, and more. It's, it has environmental impact that you know happens in a second and lasts for years. And this event will not only impact satellites and space missions, but will also require more collision avoidance maneuvering. Uh, what the Russians did today with these 1,500 pieces of track trackable orbital debris uh, poses a risk not only to those astronauts, not only to those cosmonauts, uh, but to satellites, to the interests of all nations. Hey, Mark, good morning. Sorry for the early call. Uh, we were recently informed of a satellite breakup and uh, need to have you guys uh, start reviewing the safe haven procedure. It's uh, 9.21. Uh, we are planning on performing through block eight, which will include closing the radial hatches. Uh, the time of concern is 0600. I was able to interview my friend and Harvard astrophysicist, Jonathan McDowell about this event. And he says, of course, he's very disappointed. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, how big of a deal is this? I was reading on your Twitter, you know, you've condemned uh, similar uh, tests like this in the past. So why is this such a bad idea? So an ASAT, an anti-satellite weapon, is a weapon that destroys satellites. And uh, the problem with weapons like that is that, I mean, apart from the fact that I don't not, you know, I'm kind of a peacenik, I don't like weapons in general, uh, uh, that, that uh, when you destroy a satellite, you generate lots of space debris and it puts other satellites at risk, including your own. Uh, and so, and we're at a point now where, um, you know, there's so much stuff in space already. We've got too much junk up there as it is. So deliberately creating more junk is, is like, no, no, that's the wrong direction to be going. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, so I'm not happy. I think that, and, and uh, generally the space community is unhappy with this. So this was particularly bad for the ISS because of the orbital configuration, but it's a danger to, to all space users. It's uh, ultimately going to increase the debris risk for the Chinese astronauts on the Chinese space station. I bet we don't know the orbit yet of the, uh, the debris the, the, that's uh, the debris cloud. We don't know how high it's going, right? The satellite, the target satellite was about 450 kilometers up and the debris is going to probably be at least 100 kilometers either side of that. Russia tested a direct ascent anti-satellite striking one of its own satellites. And of course, this impact created a debris field in low Earth orbit. I asked Jonathan if this could possibly impact Starlink and other low Earth orbit satellite constellations. Oh, absolutely. I think this is this is a danger to Starlink. I think that uh, it will be again, it's on the, in the level of you know, increasing the collision risk by of order 10, maybe 15%, something like that, right? Rather than doubling it. But, but it's, a, it's a measurably increased risk of collisions for Starlink. And in addition to the thousands of pieces of, you know, significant size debris that will be cataloged, there will be tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of small pieces of debris too small for the radars to track and Starlink's avoidance system won't be able to deal with that because they won't know that the debris is there. Wow. And so there, there, and so there's a range between a centimeter and 10 centimeters, which is too small to track, but big enough to really do a mischief to you if it hits your satellite. Right, I was gonna say, even with it being that small, I mean, can it still really have a big impact? Yeah, because it's it's um, it's traveling, you know, at seventeen thousand miles an hour, right? And so it, it's going to be like a bullet hole through your satellite, at least, if not worse. Wow. Uh, and so if it gets, uh, you know, it, it it can break off a solar panel. It, it if you are unlucky, it can destroy the whole satellite, or or it can go like a bullet hole through a, a critical piece of uh, piece of equipment, like the main computer or something. And and so I think we are likely in you know in a time scale of the next few years to see one of these debris objects damage a Starlink, if not destroy it entirely. And in fact, you could lose several. Right, you could have a bunch of Starlinks drifting in the operational orbit 
disabled by such debris hits, and and that's a that's a real threat to uh, to the constellation. In particular, this event happened in, an, in a part of space that wasn't very far from the space station. In the initial hours after the event, all the debris, these thousands of pieces of debris, are relatively close together still. Right. Right. And the space station is passing through the region of space that they're in. Ugh. And so it's a particularly high risk for the astronauts on board the space station, which is why they kind of went into their uh, little emergency areas and closed the hatches and so on. And and that will that risk will decrease over the coming hours. Mm -hmm. uh, and they'll open the hatches again in a few uh, tomorrow, probably. And and, uh, and and the debris will spread out along its orbit. And then it'll start spreading out in longitude as well. And within a few months, it'll be a shell around the whole Earth. And so instead of one part of space being super dangerous, it'll be all of space that's just a little bit more dangerous. Were you surprised by this? Yes and no. We knew that Russia had been doing test flights of this Noodle missile uh, for several years, but it had been doing test flights against imaginary points in space, right? You pretend there's a satellite there and you go and you can show that you can hit that point. And that's a responsible way to test it, even if it's not a very good system to, to have in the first place. Um, and so I was a bit surprised that they decided to test it against an actual satellite because, because you know, you could have predicted that people were gonna be angry about this. Sure, I mean, what do you think is like, you know, the best response, um... What, what, how should the U.S. respond to this, do you think? I don't know. The, uh, I mean, the U.S. is in a bit of an awkward position here because back in 2008, it destroyed a satellite using a missile. Now, it would say, okay, but we did it especially in a very low orbit where all the decay, all the debris would decay quite quickly, mm -hmm. right, where it wouldn't stay up for very long. Well, yes, but even so, that's a, that's a matter of degree, right? It still established the idea that, you know, you have the capability to fire these weapons and you're testing it. And so everyone else feels like they have to do the same thing. And, and so, yes, quantitatively, the U.S. test was not as bad, but as a matter of setting an example, it was not good. Uh, and, and so, and I think that was part of what led to the Indian test in, in 2019. Uh, and the rhetoric that the U.S. has had around, you know, uh, controlling space and the, the necessity to be able to fight war in space has certainly not discouraged the Russians from feeling that they need to have their own space war capability. And so I think what the US needs to do is, yes, first condemn this test, but secondly, move away from this posture of, this arms race posture of, oh, they have space weapons, so we need bigger space weapons and, and you know, on and on, right? And try and uh, use this as an opportunity to go, well, you know, this is the wrong direction to be going let's actually negotiate something that will move us away from weapons in space. That's what I would like to see. Yeah, when I first saw this, you know, I, I mean, Kessler syndrome came to mind. Do events like this kind of put us at more risk for that to become a reality? Absolutely. It, it puts us, you know, measurably closer, right? Uh, it's a significant increase in the amount of space junk up there. And that increases, that sets us, you know, just that bit further along the road. NASA Administrator Bill Nelson said in a statement that he was, quote, outraged by this irresponsible and destabilizing action. With its long and storied history in human spaceflight, it is unthinkable that Russia would endanger not only the American and international partner astronauts on the ISS, but also their own cosmonauts. Their actions are reckless and dangerous, threatening as well the Chinese space station. And some harsh words from the U.S. Space Command Commander General James Dickinson. He says, Russia has demonstrated a deliberate disregard for the security, safety, stability, and long-term sustainability of the space domain for all nations. The worst satellite, anti-satellite test ever was one that was done in 2007 by China. Okay. And that was bad because it was a very big satellite destroyed in a high orbit 
in a polar orbit as well. And so it created many thousands of pieces of debris in just the worst part of space, you know, where everyone else wants to be. Right. And and most of that debris, 12 years later, is uh, 14 years later, is still up there. Uh, now this event today is, you know, it's in a little lower orbit, still high enough that a lot of this debris, and there's going to be thousands of pieces of it, is going to stay up for five years, probably in some of it, probably for 10. And so this one event is probably going to increase the amount of trackable debris, big debris in space by about 10% overnight. I want to know from you guys in the comments, how do you think the United States should respond to this situation? Of course, I always love reading your comments, and this is definitely an event that is going to have years long impact, unfortunately. So would be interesting to hear your take on it. As always, I want to thank Jonathan for making time to provide some valuable insight for us here on the Ellie and Space channel. I got to talk to him even before CNN, and that is just so cool that he's willing to share his thoughts with us. And I hope that you guys really enjoy his perspective. Of course, I also wanted to mention that over the weekend, we passed over 25,000 subscribers here on Ellie and Space, which just absolutely blows my mind. Very exciting to think that only back in February, I started making videos about Starlink. So I really appreciate all of you guys who have been along for the ride and who trust me as your source for Starlink related information. I of course try to keep you guys as updated as I can. And I really want to shout out my Patreon supporters as well for supporting me too along the way. One of my latest investments back into the channel has been this great logo that you see by my friend Tony. So I really appreciate all of the support and I can't wait to bring you guys updated content in the future.